taken great pains to engineer it for a long life and cool running. So we have large heat sinks, we have multiple resistive elements that are spread across the heat sinks. We have adequate ventilation, even though it's a compact package, there still is more surface area for the thermal components to dissipate their heat. And we're using, of course, aluminum for the thermal radiation parts and so on. Even though it's a steel chassis, we have these large heat sinks inside to help dissipate the heat. But we over-specified our resistive elements so that even though we rated at 150 watts RMS, we have double that in terms of thermal capacity of our resistive elements. So between our excessive amount of aluminum heat sinking and the fact that we have the thermal properties spread over a large area within that chassis, it all contributes to the fact that it really is able to handle quite a bit of power efficiently and coolly. One of the worries that you have with an amplifier is operating in an area where the impedance is, or resistance is wrong, or if you have the possibility that the actual resistive elements can open up because they are overheated. So, for example, one of our competitor's units has very poor heat sinking and the thermal capacity of the resistive elements is what they rate the unit for. So, which means it heats up radically if you use a large amplifier with it and you can actually open up the resistor, which means that your amplifier itself is operating on an open load and open loads for tube amps is catastrophe. You'll blow your output transformer, you'll arc your tube sockets, you'll blow your screen resistors, you'll wipe out your tubes, and there goes your priceless, beautiful Plexi Marshall up in smoke. We gave the Mini Rock Rec three of the most popular impedance loads, which is 4, 8, and 16. And what that allows you to do is have the correct matching with your amplifier so that the tubes are actually seeing the proper load that's reflected onto the tube through the output transformer due to the proper tight tolerances of our resistive elements in our unit. So, for example, that means that you're not going to overheat your screen resistors. You have the proper matching. That means the tubes are in the proper operating parameter. All that's very critical. For us, what we're trying to do is get, first of all, the best tone, second of all, the safest load for your amplifier. It's important for the amplifier to see a proper load. We're talking about tube amps here and not solid state amps. And what it is, is it's kind of like the tube itself through the output transformer, so it's, or multiple tubes because you have a push-pull circuit. They have to operate within parameters, and the parameters are dictated by a load line. So the actual impedance reflected through the output transformer back to the tube actually is what the tubes have to operate properly within. If they don't operate within that proper load line, then they go into weird nonlinear qualities, which means they're either going to fail, they're going to sound weird, something bad is going to happen one way either tonally or reliability-wise. So it's always critical to make sure you have a proper load. Now, a solid-state amp, isn't, that isn't the case. You can operate them without loads. They just draw less current in that case. But a tube amplifier is very, very critical, the output stage. Pre-amplifiers, which run Class A, is a whole other thing. They actually get their load from the plate resistors or from the cathode loading. So that's different. But we're talking about output tubes, and it's required for them to have a proper load. So, for example, we've had questions about wattage ratings. Let's take some typical amps. A typical amplifier, say a twin reverb, is you know, rated at 100 watts RMS. RMS meaning root mean squared, 0 0.707 times the voltage of peak, and, and with using Ohm's law to derive the wattage. And it's also measured at what percent distortion, because often companies will measure their amplifiers at 5% distortion to quote the RMS figure. In the hi-fi world, of course, it's very different. They want to quote 0.01% and give you a wattage figure. But musical instrument amplifiers are usually rated up at 5% total harmonic distortion. So what you have, though, let's say we have a twin reverb and it's rated at 100 watts. And when you play a heavy note and you like have it wide open and you hit a string note, 
it's actually going to transcend beyond what the normal RMS rating is. It's actually going to put out this instantaneous peak envelope, which could be up to 150, 175 watts at that moment while you're hitting the string, provided, of course, that the master volume isn't uh, compressing the preamp and so on. Let's say you're using a clean channel wide open. That would be typically. So a 100 watt RMS amp could easily put out 150 watts peak. And that's also why you need to have the thermal capacity beyond what the RMS rating is for the amplifier. So let's have a 150 watt amp that has six output tubes. So at 150 watts, 5% distortion, when you dime it and then you're hitting a string heavy, heavy power chords, it's easily putting out 200 watts, maybe even up to 250 watts. So our excessive thermal capacity was designed with that in mind. So even though the product is rated at 150 watts RMS, we're thinking that you're going to be able to use this with a head that's wide open and it's going to be able to handle it and the resistive elements are not going to open up and it's going to be able to have enough thermal dissipation. So we took that all into consideration. Because the unit is a passive unit, and I'm going to go into that for just briefly, we built this thing as a passive unit so you didn't have to worry about active electronics you didn't have to worry about a mains cord. You didn't have to worry about a wall wart. You could plug this thing in to any amplifier anywhere. I mean, we've talked to so many roadies that work with bands that don't have AC power necessarily available in these locations. They want a passive unit so they can plug it into the amplifier output, into the box, and run it straight into the PA system, into the board, whatever. The same thing is at home. So you got a, a simple situation at home throw it in the back of your amplifier. So the idea was keep it as simple as possible. So because we made it passive, it also restricts us what we can do for the sounds of the voices of the cabinets. So for example, in our Rock Crusher recording, we have an active 11 band equalizer that allows you to tune in and really dial in tones for different voicings of speakers. But in this unit that's passive, we created these six beautiful voicings which do not emulate a particular speaker, but sonically they're very musical. So as you go through, you're going to find one of those voices that's a very pleasant voice that sounds good. And then in your board, you can EQ it more accurately. You can add, add if you have plugins and you're using it, you can use the plugins for EQ. We also have an output on this for using impulse response software. So you're able to actually if that's what you want to do, you can do that with this unit. But in terms of the actual intrinsic voices, these are six very pleasant, very musical voices, which were developed in conjunctions with tone engineers here. We've got great recording engineers in Los Angeles. We're very blessed, and we bounced a lot of voices off of them to come up with what we have. And it's easy to get to. There isn't anything fancy. You'll find your positions that you like better than others in terms of sonically, what suits your musical instrument style. So that's what our voicings are about. They're beautiful music, tonal voicings. In our Rock Crusher attenuator here, we're using an inductive reactive load on here because you're inserting this between the amplifier and the speaker cabinet. So you're actually orally listening to the effect of what happens as you go down in attenuation. And as you have witnessed uh, in the forums or playing this or so on, you'll find that people say that it's such a natural tone as you go down due to the fact that we have this reactive load that the amplifier is seeing. Now in this unit, because the primary purpose of this is a load box, a speaker substitution box, it's not as critical to have a reactive load like it is here, but it is critical to have a reactive network that interfaces with the outside world for recording PA systems and so on. And that's what we have inside of here. So as, as you know on this box, this thing is a great load box, we've told you that but it also functions as a terrific headphone interface. 
So for instance, on those late nights when you want to have no latency listening to your headphones and have an immediate response, plug your phones into here. Turn off your speaker cabinet. We have a bypass right here for the cabinet, so you can actually turn it. You have a choice of load or speaker. Turn it on load, plug in the phones in the front, enjoy yourself in complete silence. You have a level control, which controls through the direct out unbalanced, as well as the balanced. It does not affect the headphone, and it does not affect the jack that has no equalization whatsoever that would you'd use for the cab modeling software. While their levels are comparable between those three jacks, we gave you something different in each of those jacks. So we have a phase switch, which allows you, sometimes your guitar will be out of phase, depending on the amplifier, with your direct recording. So we give you the chance to actually, or the opportunity to change the phase. This headphone XLR turns off the XLR when you go into the headphone mode so that you can actually listen to what's coming without seeing the signal through your recording equipment or from the PA. And then this is the voicing switch bypass with the six positions. And on the back panel, we have the amplifier input. We have an output to the speaker cabinet if you want to run a speaker cabinet. And then we have the switch allows you to bypass it, either load or the speaker. And then we have our 4, 8, and 16 impedance switch. So we have a jack here that has no EQ whatsoever that you can use with cab modeling software. We also have two outputs here. One is a unbalanced output. Another one is a balanced output with a ground lift switch that you can utilize to go directly into your recording apparatus or a PA board or whatever you want to run it into.